welcome to the Get Over Yourself podcast. This is author and athlete Brad Kearns discovering ways to be healthy, fit, and happy in hectic, high-stress modern life. So let's slow down and take a deep breath, take a cold plunge, and expertly balance that competitive intensity with an appreciation of the journey. That's the theme of the show. Here we go. Just through clinical experience, I had found that we didn't have to follow really necessarily the steps that she did in order to get the body into a state of ketosis and really for the program to work. So within my practice, I always started with this kind of foundational approach, which was starting with the gut, removing, you know, really all grains, all sugar, limiting carbohydrates, putting your body into a state of ketosis and, and healing the gut so that your body could finally start to heal. I can't tell you how many people from a clinical experience that I had where when we remove the carbohydrates and we put them on a paleo or keto diet that they would say, well, I was experiencing, you know, whatever it was. And I didn't even realize that it was related to any of this. When you are dealing with any type of gelatin or collagen, it does become liquefied in a refrigerated state. So you're not initially going to be able to see that on your stovetop. But most of us, when we make our bone broth, we make it in big vats. I do always tell people, you know, make your own bone broth. It's an easy thing to do. And if you can't, we're here for you. Let's talk about ancestral supplements. If you're into ancestral health, primal paleo keto, you know the importance of consuming these unique agents contained in bone marrow, in the nose to tail organ meats, liver, kidney, all that stuff, the great bone broth benefits. Well, how's it going? For me, since years ago when Dr. Kate Shanahan asserted the importance of these wonderful nutritional benefits that you can't get elsewhere, eh, not too good. I don't know how to cook a liver or a kidney, but now your problems are solved forever when you go to ancestralsupplements.com, a wonderful company filled with people who are living the dream, walking their talk, and bottling up the purest, cleanest sources of grass-fed organ meats, kidney, liver, bone marrow, all in these wonderful capsules. I dump them in my smoothie every day. I'm healthy. I don't have to worry. It's an incredible dietary boost. And this is so different from swallowing a bunch of those synthetic vitamins and those giant bottles from the big box stores. Highly questionable health practice. This stuff is the real deal. Grass-fed organ meats, pure as can be, ancestralsupplements.com. Hey, listeners, it's time to learn all about the wonderful world of bone broth, real bone broth, the rich, nutritious superfood that comes from bones and joint material. Oh my gosh. It's been a wonderful awakening to add this to my diet big time. I'm fond of making my own as well as buying the quality products that you'll find in the store from people like Sharon Brown, my next guest, founder of Bonafide Provisions. So she will get into the nitty gritty details of all the wonderful health agents that are found almost exclusively, but at least in super high levels in bone broth, stuff like the glycosaminoglycans that helps your own joint and connective tissue health, and of course the collagen protein that has now become such an incredible supplement product. And Sharon also has a great story of healing with her family and this journey of starting out a company, following her dreams, and bringing a wonderful product to market. So I think you're going to be inspired. I know that I've upped my bone broth game since talking to Sharon, and hopefully you will too. So let's get into it with Sharon Brown of Bonafide Provisions. Hi, listeners. I am joined by Sharon Brown, founder, CEO of Bonafide Provisions big time bone broth maker, I would like to talk about this wonderful subject. What do you think, Sharon? I think it's great. I'm glad to be here. Tell me all about it. We've mm-hmm. heard in the, the background that bone broth is so healthy and so important. It's got these special agents like the glycosaminoglycans that help your joints and connective tissue. So I'm going to just tee you up and 
I'd love to learn about the health benefits, especially we're talking to keto enthusiasts who know that um, uh, bone broth is, is right there, keto friendly uh, uh, preparation. Um, yeah. I've been putting my um, egg yolks, thanks to Matt Whitmore, Fitter Food, cracking a couple egg yolks into the uh, the bone broth, heating up on the stove, and it's like a wonderful morning drink. So um, we'll yeah, find out some other ways we can use this stuff, huh? Yeah, great. I'd love to share. And I hope that I can um, share with everyone that when we think about bone broth, um, I think one of the questions that I often receive is, you know, is this a, is a, is it a trend? Is it a fad? And really when we kind of look at the history of bone broth and, and where it's been and, and, and where we are today, um, I don't think broth really ever exited, right? The American diet. I think it's what we did with the bone broth that our ancestors and our grandmothers used to make um, and modified it into kind of the the broth that sits on our, our grocery store shelves today. So hopefully I can can share with you that I, I don't believe that bone broth is necessarily a fad. I believe it's always been a part of the American diet. But with the education that we have now um, with social media and things like podcasts, we understand that there is a very big difference between um, broth and bone broth or stock. And those are kind of the areas that I would love to focus on. So maybe we can just get into the nuts and bolts of what bone broth is, because I, I realize that oftentimes I live in a bubble and I think that everybody knows what bone broth is. And then when I go outside of my bubble, I realize that a lot of people still don't understand what it is. Um, so maybe I should start there. Good one. Yes. I buy okay. my, I buy my broth for a dollar 99 in the, <laughs> in the cardboard carton at Trader Joe's. I drink it every day. What, what, what? Yeah. Little, yeah. little differences. Okay. Yeah. I love it. Yep. So really the idea about bone broth is when you take the bones of an animal and you cook them for a long period of time, typically 18 to 48 hours seems to be the sweet spot based on the labs that we have done. Um, when you cook the bones for a long period of time and you add a chelating agent like apple cider vinegar or lemon juice, that chelating agent simply is a magnet that pulls all the nutrients, the amino acids, the minerals, and the collage from the bones of the animal and dumps them into the broth. So very different than just throwing, say, a whole chicken into a pot um, and allowing it to cook for a few uh, hours. Um, so what happens when you cook for these long periods of time, you'll start to notice that your broth becomes very gelatinous. And that gelatin is the true sign of a real bone broth um, that's made correctly. And when I say correctly, I mean the proper bone to water ratio. And then also that you're using um, the, the, the longer cooking time and the, the simmer, the very low simmer um, method for boiling the bones. And that's really what bone broth is. Um, our uh, bone broth, and not to be too brand specific, but our chicken and our beef bone broth, um, we typically don't add really anything else other than um, some onions, garlic, and Celtic sea salt so that you really truly get the true flavors of what a bone broth should taste like. So you have water as a base, and then you're cooking out the bones and releasing all these beneficial agents that are difficult to obtain elsewhere in the diet. And when you say that it's uh, become gelatinous, does that uh, do you have to refrigerate it to see your success there? That that's when it that's when it comes uh, jello like. That's a good question. So you know um, when you are dealing with any type of gelatin or collagen it does become liquefied in a refrigerated state. So you're not initially going to be able to see that on your stovetop. But most of us, um, when we make our bone broth, we make it in big vats. I do always tell people, you know, make your own bone broth. It's an easy thing to do. Um, and if you can't, we're here for you. But make your own. And when you make your own, you want to use a very large 
uh, stock pot because you're going to be able to yield a lot of product out of those bones as opposed to, say, putting them in a crock pot. So when you cook, say, 10 quarts of bone broth, what you do is you're going to put that into, uh, you know, either the refrigerator or the freezer, and that's where you're going to be able to see that gelatin. And it should almost turn into like this jello state once it's refrigerated. And then, of course, once you heat it back up, it will liquefy and then turn into a very um, easily drinkable liquid product. So how are you getting such a big yield with a bigger pot? I, I would assume you're just putting more water in. Yeah, you're putting more water in, but you're also making sure that you have enough bones. Because if you don't have enough bones, um, you're not going to be able to really get the bene- all the benefits of the bone broth. So that rich amino acid profile, as well as all of the gelatin. So if you're doing, say, a 10-quart stock pot, you want to have at least a quart of um, bones at the bottom of that, of that stock pot. And then to your point, you add water. Um, You want to use a filtered water because the last thing you want to do is put all of this labor in um, and have a a water, you know, filtered water um, is is really important to filter out things like fluoride fluoride. here in San Diego. We have uh, fluoride in our water, things like choline, things like chlorine. You want to filter those out. Um, And then you want to add, really, if you're using it for medicinal purposes, I would suggest the minimal amount of ingredients as possible. So, you know, we understand that garlic and onion have medicinal effects. Um, So I always suggest adding those in and then some form of high-grade salt. Um, I like Selena brand Celtic sea salt. And the reason I like her particular sea salt is because she mines her sea salt in a very old fashioned way. And that means she sun dries it. And when you sun dry sea salt, rather rather than exposing it to heat, um, it retains 80 natural occurring minerals. So the sea salt actually becomes good for you. Uh, But you don't want to get super fancy with all these flavorings. And you, I mean, we have all manner of uh, suggestions on the internet to make a cherry bomb bone broth or whatever. (laughs) Yet not initially. And really, it really depends on what you are using it for. If you keep your ingredients to a minimum, you really can do whatever you want once you um, start to implement that bone broth into your, your everyday Um, diet. And so I'll give you an example. Many people like to take their bone broth and they will pour it into ice cube trays and they will freeze it um, into these uh, ice cube trays. And then they will simply take one of the cubes and add them to their morning smoothie um, or add it to saute their morning eggs in um, or their morning omelet. And you can see that if you don't really add a lot of herbs or different types of savory ingredients. Um, You're not going to, that flavor profile isn't going to transfer over to the recipe that you're creating. You can always add additional flavors after you make the bone broth, but I always suggest keeping it really simple when you're creating that, that particular base that you're going to be using. How about my egg yolk preparation? Is that, is that cool to heat up the bone broth and throw some yolks in there? You know, it's actually, and I, I really am just not saying this to, to, to I do that daily. So um, we have a, a, a line of soups that we created with bone broth. And prior to that, every morning for breakfast, I would have my, I put my bone broth on the stovetop. I would add in two uh, whipped eggs, or I would even, um, you know, just uh, boil my eggs um, in the bone broth and eat that every day for, for breakfast. So I think it's a wonderful way to do it. Yeah. Yeah, I'd love to go back to the um, the ancestral example because I remember first being exposed to the to the idea, the importance of bone broth uh, through Dr. Kate Shanahan, her book Deep Nutrition. That's now yeah. ten years old, but you know, prior to the explosion of the primal paleo movement, we were accustomed to you know nine out of ten Americans thought bone broth was the 
uh, the stock that you buy for two bucks and the cardboard thing and, and use it as a preparation for your soups or whatnot. Uh, but this, uh, this huge void in the modern diet, because we, you know, strip down and pick and choose what we consume with the animal, mostly the lean muscle meats is the popular stuff that sells. And we're missing, uh, all these foods that we've had, all these nutrients that we've had throughout, uh, human evolution. Yeah, absolutely. And when you, you know, when you think about the story of bone broth, um, Oftentimes, because I am on the road and I'm talking about bone broth often, so many times I have uh, friends that come over and, and, and we meet them and they say, oh, my goodness, my grandmother or my mother always had bone broth cooking on the stovetop. And even, you know, when I'm talking to the older generations, they say themselves, I always had bone broth cooking on the stovetop. And it was right about in the 1950s, right? When we as a society um, told moms that it really wasn't in vogue to make homemade food any longer. And, you know, it's interesting if you look back at the advertising in the 1950s, it was all about the modern woman who didn't cook and who served her family's TV dinner so that everybody could sit in front of the TV together and watch TV. And that is where we started to really see this progression of removing the process of creating real ancestral food and moving it out of our American diet. And that's exactly what happened with broths. Um, We had a big food company come in and say, oh, you know, this is just another convenient way to be able to make soups, gravies, your stuffing, um, you know, anything that you are uh, using a broth for. And we're going to we're going to replace that for you. And and we all know that these boxed and, and canned broths were really just MSG. Right. It was just a very poor version of this superfood. And unfortunately, back in the 1950s, you know, we didn't have the science behind why bone broth was a superfood. And so we accepted that replacement. Now we understand the science behind it and the amino acid profile and what those amino acids do and why truly they are, you know, bone broth is a superfood. Um, And so it's that kind of progression that started in the 1950s. And it really wasn't until, like you said, Kate Shanahan, um, Sally Fallon wrote in her Nourishing Traditions cookbook, Kayla Daniels, who came out and said, you know, this is a this is a long lost art that we need to bring back into our wellness programs because the medicinal benefits are so great. Oh my gosh. I'm thinking of the best selling book, Fast Food Nation by Eric Schlosser. And he talks about around the same time period. I think it was maybe into the sixties when the fast food restaurants exploded and uh, took the nation by storm with the founding of McDonald's and the spreading of the other franchises, Carl's Jr., Wendy's, and how the the pitch, the advertising pitch was that you could save the time and energy that it took to prepare a family home-cooked meal and just drive to uh, the burger joint, spend only a few bucks, and all of a sudden, you know, eating became affordable. Uh, but in the, in the, in the, uh, in the process, we lost that uh, centerpiece of healthy family living, which was the the home cooked meal and the shared experience of preparing the food from scratch, and then not to mention the uh, the nutrient quality. So when you're buying the watered down stuff, even today, when you see beef broth or chicken broth, um, what are they uh, what are they doing to short circuit the process of uh, doing what you guys do at Bonafide to make a, a proper bone broth product? Yeah, well, they're they're doing a couple of things. The first thing, <laughs> they're, first, they're, they're, they're hiring <laughs> low wage workers to come in and get, <laughs> get work in poor working conditions. Okay, okay. Yeah, well, you know, from from an ingredient perspective, I, you know, they're really kind of doing the same thing that they did back in the 1950s and 60s. They're taking this superfood and they're packaging it in a way that. Um, conveys to the consumer that it's the same thing. Unfortunately, as of today, the FDA does not have any type of regulation against um, or for the verbiage bone broth. So that means that you or I can simply um, put some water in a pot and add some beef flavoring 
And we could theoretically sell that on the grocery store shelf as bone broth and not have any bones at all in the process of making that product. And that's um, one of the ways that um, we are seeing um, these products being sold. In fact, I, I can share a story with you. I met with a retailer a couple of years ago that was kind of still scratching their heads. They were new to bone broth. They didn't understand bone broth. And I, I met with the, the category buyer and she said to me, you know, we've, 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 it seems to me that we as a retailer just need to go back to their drawing board because we probably just need to take all of our stock that we have on our shelf and rename it um, as bone broth. And lo and behold, that's exactly what they did because I've, I, I'm familiar with this retailer. And when I walked in and looked at, oh, they have bone broth now on their shelf and I turn it around, it was the exact same product that they used to sell on the shelf two years ago that they referred to as stock. Um, so really, you know, it's it's this whole concept that I know that we all um, really preach about and and adhere to and has really just become a part of our lifestyle. And that is that you have to not only read labels, but scrutinize them. So you, a, a company should be very transparent about what goes into that product. And it should be uh, easily understood um, with their ingredients. And if you aren't seeing bone broth or bones in that the first ingredients, there's a problem there. The other thing that you want to do is you want to make sure that the product doesn't just say broth, um, because that means that there aren't any bones used in the making of that product. So you want to make sure that it talks about the bones and then anything after those ingredients should simply be things like um, the water, the salt, you know, the garlic and the onions. Anything else is just filling that package up with things that are not going to be um, used really for, for the body as, as a medicine. Oh, so we do have that guideline where we can look for bones on the label and know that they, uh, they took those necessary steps or the absence of the word bones uh, conveys that. I guess, is it properly termed stock then if it's not, if it's not bone broth? No, it, it, they can call it broth. So what you might see is it'll say bone broth, and then the second ingredient might say broth. And that's what we refer to as a filler broth, meaning they do have a little bit of bone broth in there, but the second ingredient is just regular old, I don't want to kind of say the brand's name, um, you know, the kind of broth that you used to buy back in the 1960s. That is what that broth refers to. So you want to make sure that your bone broth doesn't have broth in it. It just has bone broth in it. Uh, and so the litmus test for the interested consumer would be to uh, refrigerate the product and hope to see the gelatinous formation. Absolutely. And, you know, that's really what you're going to do at home. Um, and that's actually how we ended up putting, you know, uh, merchandising our bone broth in the frozen set at the grocery store. Because when I early on, when I met with retailers, they would say to me, you know, the consumer is going to go to the grocery store shelf to buy their broth. And I said to them, but it's not going to be where they buy their bone broth. Because when you make your own bone broth at home, I shared with you the steps. Your bone broth is not only going to gel when you make it at home, but you're also going to store your bone broth in either your refrigerator or the freezer. And naturally, as a consumer, that's where we want to find our product, because that's letting us know that it's as close to homemade as it possibly can be. It's similar to sauerkraut, right? So I I grew up in that era in the 1960s, and we used to shop for our sauerkraut on the grocery store shelves, and it was really the only place available back then where you could buy it. But now we buy our sauerkraut and our fermented foods in the refrigerated section so that those products can continue to maintain the efficacy of the products. Wow. So it's sort of a flip-flop. Like you want to find your broth, your legit broth in the freezer or fridge, but then a, a, a truly fermented product would not need refrigeration. Is that what you're saying? No, I'm sorry. A truly fermented product 
product does need refrigeration. So it was very similar, you know, back in the 1960s, we would shop for um, our product on the on the shelves, the inner aisle in in either, a, you know, back then, not necessarily a box, but a can. Right. And now when we are looking and we're shopping for those fermented products, they're in the refrigerated section, similar to bone broth. You you know, it used to be that our broth or, you know, stocks were on the grocery store shelves. But in order to to um, maintain the efficacy of the product, you want to be looking in the frozen set or in the refrigerator set, just like you store it at home. Wow. So we're. Uh, getting armed with some information now where we can uh, shop discreetly, uh, d- discriminately. And I'm also curious about uh, the quality difference between these products that are legitimately bone broth, but is there any, uh, is there any shortcutting or things to uh, be aware of, especially those price points? Because sometimes I see a small quantity of bone broth uh, for seemingly a lot of bucks for, you know, I don't know, uh, 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 10 bucks for a small container. And I'm wondering, um, is this just better than, are, are the prices pretty similar per ounce or is there some variation there that the consumer might be aware of? Yeah, I, you know, I think, um, there's a few things to, to really look for in the product, particularly at the price points that you're speaking of. Um, it can get costly to purchase your own bone broth, although, you know, it used to be that when you would make your own or, or purchase it, um, you can save a lot of money making your own. But the price of bones has gone up so much that sometimes it's it's um, it, it costs about the same. But when you are purchasing, you know, this this big dollar item, there's a couple of things that you want to look for. You know, the first thing, and it's so important to me just as a nutritionist um, and a mom who, you know, who fed my children this product for years, is that you want the product to be certified organic. Um, And I, I, I know I'm preaching to the choir here when I say this, but, and you all probably know this, but when you have a product that's organically certified and it has that certification every process for that product has to be organic certified so even the um the cleaning agents that we use to clean our big you know 10 quart 20 quart much bigger now uh, 40 quart stock pots have to be organic you know i can't just throw any type of dishwashing liquid um, on, on, you know, in, in the uh, cleaning process. So everything that we use in our warehouse has to be um, organic. Um, and so that certified organic is very important. That means that the bones are certified organic and every product and process is certified organic. So that's one of the things that you want to look for. The next thing you want to look for is the long cooking time. That 18 to 48 hours, we've done labs, and we started our original labs at about four hours, and we would simmer our bone broth, pull labs, and look for um, the highest amino acid content that we could achieve. And what we found is that when we got to that 18-hour mark and between 18 hours and 48 hours, there really wasn't much of a difference when you went from that 18 to 48 hours, but there was a huge difference when you went from say 12 to 18. So you want the longer cooking time, 18 to 48 hours is typically what you want to look for with a brand. Um, And then finally, you want to make sure that when you turn that package around, it says bone bones. And if the FDA, if it's a beef, it'll, the FDA will want you to say broth and then it'll, it'll say bone broth and it'll list what's in that that bone broth. And that's what you're looking for. You don't want any extra added stock, powder, or broth in that product. And then you are you pretty much know that, you know what, the, this product that I'm buying is is the real deal, um, and it warrants that, that added dollar cost. And we're going to see cooking time revealed on the label, typically? 
Typically, you will find it'll say a long simmer. You'll find it on the back of the packaging. Um, and, you know, we to, most of us have our phones right at our fingertips. Look up the product and, and look for that longer cooking time. Absolutely. Especially if it's a product that you're going to start incorporating into your diet. Um, do a little bit of research. So, Sharon, for the keto enthusiast, what kind of macronutrient profile are we looking at when we're consuming a pint of bone broth? Yeah. So, you know, I, I love um, our, our keto friends. And it's, it's interesting because, um, you know, and, and, I, and I, I know that you know this, putting in our body into a state of ketosis is, is really nothing new, right? And um, there's a, a doctor named... Uh, Natasha Campbell McBride, and she wrote a book called Gut and Psychology Syndrome. I'm not sure if you are familiar with that book, um, but she wrote this book because she was a neurologist that uh, cured her son of autism um, using a ketogenic diet um, and putting his little body into ketosis. And the main uh, really foundation of the program is ketosis, but it's also bone broth. And she, um, as I said, was a neurologist, was able to cure her son um, using autism. And so I, I was a GAPS practitioner. I worked with thousands of people across the country, um, walking them through the, the GAPS program. And it was so crazy, you know, 10 years ago, because people were so afraid of putting their body into ketosis. <laughs> and now we recognize that it's, you know, really just a wonderful thing for your body to, to enter this state of ketosis. But I think the most important thing for the keto community and the person who is following the keto diet is really the amino acids that are available in bone broth. Um, and that, that is across the board. It's not just with our keto friends, but um, for instance, glycine. So glycine is one of the powerhouse amino acids that are in bone broth. And you get that higher level of glycine with the longer cooking time of the bone broth. But glycine does two things. The first thing that glycine does is it helps absorb the protein you eat. OK, so we we know that if you're not able to absorb and uptake the food that you eat, then what's the point? We should all be eating Snicker bars. Right. Um, if you are able to absorb the protein that you eat, the protein's going to go to the places in the body that it needs to. You're going to utilize that protein. Glycine helps with that. But the other thing that glycine does is it conjugates with bile acid and it helps in lipid absorption, fat absorption. And oftentimes I, I worked with a lot of recovering vegetarians and vegans in my <laughs> practice. Uh. Recovering. Yeah, they needed to recover. And um, oftentimes what happened with my, my friends who were recovering from a vegetarian or vegan diet was their gallbladder pretty much shut down. It did not know how to, um, to really uh, utilize fat any longer. And so it, oftentimes they would come to me and they would say, oh, just the thought of, of eating meat, it just makes me you know, want to gag. And the reason was is because their, their gallbladder, it's a lazy organ, pretty much had shut down. It wasn't being used. So it kind of went to sleep. There was no, you know, it wasn't having to digest all of these wonderful animal fats. And so I would actually help them kind of do this gallbladder recover recovery. And one of the things that we would use is bone broth because the bone broth, the glycine in the bone broth helps with the bile acid and it helps with your lipid absorption. So you can not only absorb the fat, but you're going to be able to put the fat where it needs to go, right? To like your brain, where it where is the most important part of, of where we need the fat to, to go, especially on um, the keto diet or any diet. Um, and so you know, as I said, most Americans really have a hard time digesting fat. We, I grew up on this low fat diet craze, right? And we were the low fat, um, high carb, uh, 1980s, you know, lots of pa pasta type of thing. And that gallbladder 
kind of shuts down. And so um, the glycine is so key for the keto diet because of the bile acid assistance that it helps with for you to be able to digest the fat. Oftentimes we find with people who um, come onto the, the keto diet, um, they start to have greasy stools. That is a direct result of their gallbladder not functioning well. And so one of the things that we do is we would um, have them drink copious amounts of uh, bone broth for um, the glycine. The other, um, not to nerd out on everybody, so, you know, sorry that we're getting into these specifics about amino acids, but I think the other piece of the component with keto and really just anybody that's trying to um, live a better, healthier lifestyle um, and really be able to utilize their food as fuel, um, that is the amino acid glutamine. So glutamine is like, um, unlike any other amino acid, um, it's very unique because it's the primary fuel that's used by the cells that line your gut. Okay, so these little cells that line your gut prefer a specific type of food and the food that they prefer, their number one choice um, is glutamine. Um, and so much so that when glutamine comes in contact with the cells, the cells absorb it directly, very quickly. And then when the cells are fed this food that they love, the cell will then produce mucus in your gut. And I know it sounds kind of gross, but it's actually a good mucus because what that mucus does is it coats the mucosal lining of your gut and it acts like a sewing needle for the little tears in your gut. Most Americans have tears in their gut. We refer to it as a leaky gut syndrome. And even if you aren't having symptoms, most of us have some type of uh, leaky gut simply because of the lifestyle that we live, right? We drink too much coffee, we're under too much stress, and we've been exposed to far too many pesticides and toxins. Those, um, that American lifestyle leads to these little tears in our mucosal lining of the gut. And what the glutamine does is it almost acts like a spackle because of how the cells react to the glutamine. So for somebody who's on keto that's eating a lot of amazing food and is so intentional about what they're putting in their body, it's really important that what you are ingesting in your body is being utilized, right? Uptaken and absorbed. And the way that you do that is you focus on the health of your gut. I think I lost you there. So we have the digestive aids, the glycine. We have the uh, support for the gut lining. Mm -hmm. And can you talk about the uh, highly touted joint compounds that are found in high levels in bone broth? Sure. So um, proline. Um, proline is an essential component of collagen, right? And so that's really where you are going to see that wonderful gelatinous quality of, of the bone broth. When you are looking at um, that jelly-like substance, that really is the collagen from the bones of the animal that you are extracting and now you are um putting into to the bone broth when you when you make the longer cook it, cooked methods of the bone broth. Um, that, that proline is an essential component of collagen. It helps with cellular regeneration. Um, it helps with tissue repair. And it also helps you rebuild collagen. And we know, you know, collagen is such a uh, a wonderful new product that many of us are incorporating into our diets. And there's many ways that we're getting collagen in. I mean, there's products, um, you know, one of my favorite peanut butter companies now is putting a collagen powder in their peanut butter. Um, wonderful um, additions, uh, you know, to, to, to our health. 
But when you think about the most readily available source of collagen, it really is in bone broth um, because your body recognizes that form of collagen to be just like your own. Animal collagen is is very, very similar to a human's collagen. And so when we drink that, the body not only readily recognizes it, it absorbs it. And the way that I like to kind of share my philosophy, and it really was my philosophy before I became a bone broth slinger, you know, um, before I had bona fide provisions as a company, I was a nutritionist and that's what I did. And that was my passion. And and that's what I loved. And I, I worked with thousands of people all across the country. I had a four month wait list to work with me and not necessarily because of me, but because of the program that um, that I prescribed. And the program really was this whole food approach to living, right? Very little supplementation and supplements when needed, right? Um, but really trying to understand that our body is a machine. And this machine has been created to be fueled by food, not um, really any other thing than, than food. And, and then of course, you know, water and, and beverages, but food. And so it's most recognizable source of energy and protein and collagen and whatever it is, is going to be from your food. So I always encouraged my, um, whoever I was working with my, my patients to heal when they could using food. And I always liked to give this example. If you think about an, uh, vitamin C and you're trying to get your vitamin C in, what is the body's most recognizable way to get that vitamin C? What is it going to recognize most quickly, right? When you put that, uh, say, orange on your tongue, it sends a neurotransmitter to your brain. Your brain starts producing saliva. Then your brain starts telling your, your, your stomach to make hydrochloric acid. Your pancreas starts, you know, kicking out um, the enzymes to be able to. And so it's this beautiful cascade that your body has been created to do the minute you put food on your tongue. Um, so the preferred method by this body that you're trying to fuel is food. So always reach for food, always reach for collagen in its most pure form. And then when you can't, you know, I would always suggest supplementation. Um, so that's, you know, that's probably a kind of a bigger, broader thought process. Um, but that proline that's in the bone broth is a really important uh, uh, component um, of the collagen and the cellular regeneration and the tissue repair. Great. So if I'm looking at a, a, a pint of bone broth, am I looking at mostly protein, uh, low to no carb, a little bit of fat? What's the, what's the ratio? Yeah, absolutely. And it really just depends on on how you're making it. Right. And so it's going to be very little to no carb. Um, it's going to be it's not going to be really uh, high in fat, um, but the ratio is probably going to be within that that um, keto profile to put your body into a state of ketosis. And it really depends on how you make your bone broth, right? So some people like to add a lot of um, ingredients to their bone broth, particularly vegetables. That's going to increase um, the carbohydrate profile of it. Um, and so you, it, you know, you, you really, that's another reason why you really want to um, really stick to kind of the minimal amount of ingredients. And then one thing that I really love to do with my bone broth is really replace it in, um, any type of liquid. So for some people, it's a big stretch to replace their bone broth in the place of coffee. And I get that because I love my, my, um, my coffee with my butter and my MCT oil in the morning. However, for an afternoon snack, I always suggest, and we have it often here at the office is to grab your bone broth, um, add some MCT oil or some ghee or some butter really increase that fat content. And now you have not only this amazing keto cup really in your hand, but also you get all of the benefits of the amino acid profile that's in the bone broth. 
So it really is this, this superfood. And, you know, I also think it's just important to understand, um, you know, the, the healing benefits of the bone broth on the gut. So when we think about keto and putting the body into a state of ketosis, we, you know, we understand, look, you're going from this carbohydrate driven state to this fat driven state. You know, it's the, e- that's the easiest way, you know, at, um, to try to explain what we're trying to do in the area of keto and ketosis. But beyond that, we still need to remember that we're fueling this machine and we need vitamins and we need minerals and we need amino acids so that it can do the best job that it can do for us, right? And I think even with, and I, you may experience this as well. I, it's interesting because when I would have clients and patients that came into my office and, you know, we would say, okay, we're going to put you on a a no grain diet or, or even, you know, just having something like a a gluten-free. Well, all of a sudden they were just eating a bunch of Mm gluten-free or grain-free junk, right? (laughs) It's like I could go down up and down the aisles of the grocery store with my children and they will load in, you know, as much junk as they possibly can and say, but mom, it's gluten-free, it's grain-free, it's keto. (laughs) And we have to remember that, you know, there's so many wonderful benefits of following a keto diet. I've been following a keto diet for probably 10 years now. Wow. You're an early trendsetter, Sharon. Well, you know what? It was actually because of my son that we we healed, you know, really with this whole GAPS protocol. What does um, that stand for? Yeah. So GAPS stands for gut and psychology syndrome. And as I said, it was written by Dr. Natasha Campbell McBride, who healed her son of autism. And the whole concept is that there is a direct correlation between the gut and the brain. So much so that when we are in utero and we're being formed in our mother's womb, there's a piece of tissue and one breaks off and becomes the gut and the other piece of the tissue breaks off and becomes the brain. And these two tissues or organs are forever in communication via something called your enteric nervous system. And that's why um, whatever you put into your gut affects your brain and whatever you put in your brain affects your gut. And this neurologist neurosurgeon knew that her son's brain was a mess, right? He had autism, but she thought, I'm not going to do what every other doctor is doing. I'm going to fix his gut. And when I fix his gut, I think I'm going to be able to fix his brain. And that's exactly what she did. Um, And in doing so had him uh, really in in a state of ketosis for um, the first part of the program to be able to heal his, his brain. And then of course she went on to train practitioners all across the world, not just the United States um, with the gaps protocol to heal people of really any type of mental issues. So ADD, ADHD, dyspraxia, dyslexia, um, anxiety, um, anybody who is on the spectrum um, autism, um, and with great, great, uh, deals of success, um, just by putting people on this GAPS diet, which really does put your body into a state of ketosis. Uh, so is that something that you integrated into your practice? It is. And I did a modified version, um, of her GAPS program. Um, it evolved over time just through clinical experience. I had found that we didn't have to, um, follow, really necessarily the steps that she did in order to get the body into a state of ketosis and really for the program to work. So within my practice, I always um, started with this kind of foundational approach, which was starting with the gut, removing, you know, really all grains, all sugar, um, limiting carbohydrates, putting your body into a state of ketosis and, uh, and healing the gut so that your body could finally start to heal. Wow, that's pretty uh, that, that's pretty heavy duty to make that connection. I don't think a lot of people have connected those dots appropriately. We know the science is emerging, and you, you, some some highly respected uh, leaders in that space. And uh, I guess if you were to um, talk to a, a general listener that might have 
maybe something subclinical like um, anxiety creeping into the picture here and there in our hectic modern technology addicted lives, could we actually uh, expect to address those conditions through, let's say, uh, ambitious consumption of bone broth and then uh, ditching the, uh, the processed carbohydrates at the same time? Yeah, because if you think about really the biochemical process, right, with anxiety or depression, where is our dopamine and our serotonin created? It's created within our gut. And because so many Americans have have eaten far too many carbs, we are carbaholics, right? Um, just look at our food pyramid, you know, 10 years ago. Um, and it's the same, you know, really diet that all of our parents uh, ate and I was fed. Um, you know, we have gut dysbiosis. And when you have gut dysbiosis, you are not going to be able to make the serotonin and the dopamine that would allow you bi biologically and biochemistry to be able to have this wonderful outlook on life. You know, um, many people don't relate the mind back to the gut. And this is one really great example that I that I had shared in my practice when I would um, when I would go around San Diego and, and, and share with different groups and lecture. And I, and I think that it really kind of gives this picture of the gut and brain connection. Um, I just had mentioned how the gut and brain is closely related. They're always communicating via something called your enteric nervous system. And one of the ways that we know for sure that um, there is this direct relationship is probably the way that we've all experienced it. So most people um, do not like to public speak. They don't like to get up and speak. You know, even in a classroom, you don't like to get up in front of somebody and speak. And oftentimes we refer to, oh, I get butterflies. It can even kind of send you running to the bathroom. Some people get a very upset stomach and it has nothing to do with anything they've eaten, but everything to do with what they're thinking. So just the thought that's in your brain that you're going to have to get up in public speak starts to affect your stomach. Transversely, the same thing happens when you have a toxic gut and you are somebody who grew up right, you know, like most of us with this carb laden diet, um, what you are putting into your gut becomes toxic to your brain. And so cleaning up that gut will clean up the brain. Love it, Sharon. I'm, I'm glad you brought this uh, extra little angle in. <laughs> and I guess, you know, some good motivation to try to include bone broth. I know Dr. Kate has her four pillars of uh, human nutrition, and I thought I was a, a healthy eating primal aligned guy, but I realized I was almost completely devoid of uh, that important, uh, those important categories of organ meats and, and meat on the bone, particularly getting uh, the collagen and the the aminos that you mentioned and those benefits, uh, particularly for, for gut health. Cause like you said, um, you know, we have our, we have our, uh, severe clinical diagnosis patients with celiac. Uh, but then as Mark Sisson argued in the primal blueprint as well, uh, almost everyone is, uh, basically allergic or sensitive to grains and gluten at some level. It just mm -hmm. manifests as, the gas and the bloating or the brain fog in the afternoon in between our high carbohydrate meals or things that we pass off as normal, but can be righted when we turn the corner and emphasize the, the, the foods that are missing in the diet, such as the organ meats and the bone broth, and then ditching the processed stuff. Absolutely. And, you know, that I can't tell you how many people, um, from a clinical, uh, experience that I had where, when we remove the carbohydrates and we put them on a paleo or a keto, keto diet that they would say, well, I was experiencing, you know, whatever it was. And I didn't even realize that it was related to any of this. And there's just, you know, the cascade effect um, of, of what happens when you eat these high, high, high carbohydrate diets. Um, Really, it, it, it's just layer upon layer 
that you have to start peeling back. And and to Mark's point, it's not going to affect everybody in the same way. Not, you know, somebody who isn't is gluten intolerant isn't going to be necessarily running to the bathroom all the time. It will manifest itself in many different ways um, to to uh, to different people. And so really the, the eliminating it completely really is the best way um, to, to start to understand and feel the effects of it. Oh, that's great. Thanks, Sharon. I want to get a couple more questions in before you go about uh, making it ourselves. We can uh, yeah. get your uh, recommendations at the end of how to find these bona fide products and how that's going. Uh, but when we're doing it at home, you know, we're here in the Instant Pot craze. And I know from the directions that uh, they tout that the bone broth can be made in a fraction of the time from the slow cooking method. And so I'm wondering, am I going to lose any value if I follow the Instant Pot instructions? I believe it's something like five hours instead of that, that sweet spot of 18 to 48 hours that you're doing with traditional slow flame. Yeah, good question. So we... Um, we are uh, fans of Instapot. Um, I think the cautionary tale with the Instapot is, and, and we all kind of know this, oftentimes you just can't rush certain things. Um, and that would one of them would be bone broth. So certainly when you make bone broth in your Instapot, you're going to get the benefits of a wonderful tasting product, right? That's going to have some of the um, properties of, a, a medicinal bone broth, but you do need the longer cooking times, the slower cooked, longer cooking times in order to be able to pull the maximum amount of the nutrients, the collagen, the amino acids from the bones of the animal. So um, if you're using it for cooking pur purposes, absolutely. If you're using bone broth to incorporate into your diet for medicinal purposes to reap all the benefits of the bone broth, it's better to just throw it on the stovetop um, and cook your cook your longer cooking method bone broth that way. And as I said, you know, 18 to, to 48 hours, 18 hours really is um, is is where you're going to be able to get that maximum amount. Um, and then you want to do a really, really slow simmer um, on that broth. I suppose you could use the low pressure on the Instant Pot and, uh, it, it, you know, or, or a crock pot, I guess, is a good, a good tool as well, uh, b besides the stovetop. Yeah, a lot of people love to make their bone broth in their crock pot, and you'll be able to make a wonderful um, medicinal uh, bone broth in your crock pot. My only caution to, to folks is that it can get quite expensive when you do it that way because most crock pots will not yield as much as, say, a 10-quart stock pot. And so um, it can be a little bit more costly to do it that way. Um, because you're not yielding as much bone broth as you possibly can from the bones that you're using. Um, so it, it is a wonderful way to do it, and you will get a wonderful medicinal bone broth from that. But for those who are trying to uh, save some money, um, it's better to do it in the larger pots to yield more broth. Uh, okay, I, I don't understand. If we if we can fit the bones in the crock pot, or let's say the the slow cook on the instant pot, and go for eighteen hours time, uh, aren't we aren't we getting maximum yield based on how much water the pot can hold? You are, but what we have found is that people put far too many bones in their crock pot. Oh. And so if you put take those bones and you put them in the crock pot, and let's just say you put five quarts of water, um, all of a sudden you now have, let's just say, you know, uh, uh, several cups of, of bone broth that you've yielded from that. If you take that same amount of, of, of bones and now you're putting it in in 10 quarts, you are still going to be able to, with a longer cooking time, yield that amino acid profile, the collagen profile. These are based on labs that we've done and almost get double the amount of broth simply because you're, you have a, a 
a larger pot that you're putting it in. Um, so one one of the ways that you can do that is you just really with the crock pot is you decrease the, the amount of bones that you're putting in there. But it can take you some time to figure out those ratios. Yeah, so there's no such thing as a ultra high potency bone broth because you wedged more bones into the pot. Is that what you're saying? Right. Absolutely. Okay. So we got to go out and get a giant pot. And what are the, your favorite or the most yield uh, types of uh, bones to use? I know I go to the butcher and ask for the joints because they're cheaper and uh, seemingly have uh, more connective tissue and, and the more the better. That's my understanding. Yeah, that's exactly it. So the joints, um, the knuckles, um, really any parts of the bones, the, the, the backbones um, for the beef. And then, I, of course, for the chicken, you want to add the chicken feet. Um, the feet uh, of the chicken is where the chicken actually um, holds most of its collagen. And so you will find that your chicken broth is slightly more gelatinous than your beef broth. And that's simply because you're adding those chicken feet in. And with the chicken, you're looking for the backs, the wings, um, and the wing tips for the bones. And it really is an easy process as we've talked about. You know, it's, it's really, um, we use a triple filtered water. You want to source your bones from organic, grass-fed, pasture-raised um, chicken bones. Um, you want to add in, it, you know, if you're somebody who loves the medicinal properties of garlic and onion, which I do, add that in, a little bit of Himalayan or Celtic sea salt, and, and a little bit of apple cider vinegar that's going to act like that chelator or magnet that pulls all everything from the bones of the animal and dumps it into that, that liquid gold. So a little goes a long way with the apple cider vinegar, just some tablespoons in a, in a large pot or what? Yeah, little goes a long way. You don't need a lot of it, about maybe two tablespoons for a large 10-quart stock pot. And I have found that those who are sensitive to vinegar um, typically can tolerate the vinegar when they're making their own or, or purchasing it simply because you're cooking the product for such a long period of time. Um, it's not like, you know, eating a, a, a spoonful of straight vinegar. Uh, so we know about choosing the uh, grass-fed pasture-raised animal because the flesh and the uh, the fatty acid profile and the, the hormones, pesticides, antibiotics, objectionable agents in the actual meat. But when we're talking about the bones, uh, how are we getting a uh, disparity between organic, uh, naturally raised versus a conventional uh, purchase of a joint material, let's say? Um, so if, you're, if your question is... It, why are, mm -hmm. are we doing that with the bones? I mean, it's going to be simply because it's the same, it, the, you know, the, it's the same science behind what you're trying to find with the proper omegas, right, um, with the meat versus the bones. I mean, it has, you know, the bones of the animal really is just the animal itself. And so you want to make sure that everything that went into the growing of that animal, the feeding of that animal, the slaughtering of that animal all really does adhere to those, you know, the, those same practices. Love it. Thank you so much for the hour of power education on <laughs> bone broth, Sharon. Tell us about bona fide provisions and how you got this thing to be the, uh, the number one in, uh, in frozen bone broth in the whole nation right now, huh? Thank you. I appreciate that. And really not to put a plug for our company, just to share, you know, I always tell everybody, make your own bone broth. And if you can't, we're here for you. Um, and we're going to do it just the way that you do it at home. So it was really, um, I'll give you the Cliff Notes version or Reader's Digest, depending on your age. <laughs> um, but I, 12 years ago, had a, a, a son who was six years old, had been on uh, antibiotics for the majority of his first six years of life. Um, we were told that he had ADD and um, we decided we were going to do something different. And so we pulled him out of school 12 years ago and I came across the concept of bone broth 
and the idea that bone broth heals the mucosal lining of the gut. And so I started putting bone broth in every single thing that I cooked for him. I hid it in everything, even waffles and rice and anything else that I was feeding this child. Um, I put him really initially on a on a, a paleo diet, um, which was more like this GAPS diet, and we healed him. Um, and I uh, then created a, a nutrition practice. I opened a nutrition practice in Del Mar. And my biggest challenge was trying to get people to make their own bone broth. There wasn't one on the market that met my standards. So I enlisted my husband, who was a chef, and I said, will you make bone broth for my clients. And that's what we did. And so here we are today. Um, and we have bone broth in the frozen set, as well as a soup line that we just launched. Um, and we are just excited to be a part of um, people's homes and their fitness regimen. Um, and as I said, love people to make their own bone broth. And if they can't, we're here for you. How about that? It can it get any better than that? And I guess if you <laughs> if you start buying a lot, you're going to be wanting to make more at home. And if you're making a lot at home, you might be grabbing some more at the store when you get in between batches because it is yeah. an arduous task to do it right. And I, I've you know I've messed up some recipes before, or forgotten about it, or had the flame on too high, or whatever. And so I, I appreciate that convenience. And it seems like the product category is growing, which is great for everyone in it. So I appreciate yes. all your hard work and that wonderful story about your son and should give us all pause for reflection because we're kind of heading in the opposite direction where more and more kids are being diagnosed, treated with medication, and we're kind of ignoring that dietary element when we uh, pursue uh, mainstream medical solutions or uh, care for these uh, all, all manner of conditions. Absolutely. Hippocrates was right. And it really is um, overused, but it's so foundational that food is medicine. And that's how we should be approaching our health um, and our wellness and our chronic diseases. Sharon Brown of Bonafide Provisions. We can go look at your website. Is it, is it bonafideprovisions.com? It is. It's okay. there. Yep. Yep. Thank, thank you, you for, everyone. Thank you for all the info. Thanks for listening, everyone. Okay. Thank you for listening to the show. We would love your feedback at getoveryourselfpodcast at gmail.com. And we would also love if you could leave a rating and a review on iTunes or wherever you listen to podcasts. I know it's a hassle. You have to go to desktop iTunes, click on the tab that says ratings and reviews, and then click to rate the show anywhere from five to five stars. And it really helps spread the word so more people can find the show and get over themselves because they need to. Thanks for doing it.